Public indecency in Douglas County is getting a lot of attention lately. No need to hide the kids. We'll just do friendly stuff here. County commissioner threatened to ban Pride Fest from the county fairgrounds after a drag show inadvertently revealed a plastic chest plate. Then Parker realized that an old ordinance against public lewdness would prevent its performing arts center from showing the Rocky Horror Picture Show next month. Steve Steger has the revealing report. We perform a couple times a month. Thomas West is no stranger to the Rocky Horror Picture Show. He's part of Colorado's elusive ingredient, a shadow cast that performs the movie during screenings all around town. It's, it's a whole production in front of the production that's happening on the screen. He was, however, a stranger to Parker's laws, one of which could have put the brakes on their performance coming up on October 28th. I laughed. <laughs> it's, it's definitely an uh, interesting law. See, Parker's ordinance against lewd and indecent displays currently would prevent the movie from being shown because at a few points in the Rocky Horror Picture Show, you can see a woman's bare breast. And since the Pace Center, where the movie is shown, has a liquor license, Parker's law says they would be banned from such a display. It never came up until we started talking about a show there. If you go through every municipal code in the United States of America, you're going to find crazy laws dating from, you know, uh, the 1801 Muni Charter. You know, you, you can't hitch your donkey to a tree on the 16th Street. David Lane is a civil rights attorney, actually responsible for the current court precedent regarding this exact topic. He represented a group of women who fought a law in Fort Collins that banned women from being topless, but not men. The 10th Circuit Court of Appeals agreed with them. Circuit Court of Appeals said basically nipples is nipples. If men can do it, women can do it. Meaning Parker's law. It's on the books, but it's not enforceable. It doesn't necessarily make sense to have uh, such an old law on the books. The Parker Town Council is already working on a fix, changing its law so the show can go on. And as this story of antiquated laws has spread, West says tickets are actually getting gobbled up. He promises people won't be disappointed. It is a wild ride from uh, start to finish, and you'll be up on your feet dancing and having fun the entire time and partying with the cast. And I won't be offended. No. <laughs> Depending on who you are. <laughs> Depending on who I am. Yeah. I checked in with Parker today to see if they've enforced this law at any time in the last few years. They searched since 2019. Couldn't find any instances of it. The town council will vote on this early next month, and this would actually allow any movie theater in Parker, if they want to now, that shows like an R-rated movie that yeah. Matt ha may have some of this, some of this stuff. Yeah, they could have a liquor license uh, under this new change in law if they go ahead with it on October third. Think of the children. <laughs> Think of the children. <laughs> that was essentially the argument in yeah. that 10th Circuit Court of Appeals case. And the 10th Circuit said, you can ban toplessness. you got to do it for men if you're going to do it for women. Yeah. And, well, men probably wouldn't like that very no, much. No, so, not, not right. much at all. Thank you, Steve. Mm -hmm. Today marks three weeks until ballots get mailed out in Colorado. Can you believe it? Three weeks before mail-in ballots start showing up. You will have a lot of important decisions to make. So we will be bringing you seven televised debates this year. It's an unprecedented number, far as we can figure, in election year history recently in Colorado. You deserve to hear direct answers to pointed questions from candidates and to see them talk respectfully with each other about their differences. All but one statewide candidate has agreed to participate. So we will begin with Colorado's most closely contested congressional race. Democrat Yadira Caraveo and Republican Barbara Kirkmeyer, they're running to represent the new 8th in Adams and Weld counties. They'll debate 6.30 on October 13th here on 9 News. Then there will be a whole string of debates airing on next. Attorney General, Secretary of State, Treasurer, and the 7th Congressional District in Jeffco and part south. Then on October 28th, the only scheduled televised debate in the race for U.S. Senate. Republican Joe O'Day and Democratic Senator Michael Bennett will debate on 9 News. The night before, October 27th, Democratic Governor Jared Polis has agreed to debate Republican challenger Heidi Ganahl. Ganahl is the sole candidate among the 14 invited who has not yet agreed to debate here. The idea of more people carrying Narcan to prevent opioid overdoses in Colorado has gotten some public support, but we've also seen some public mockery from conservatives. Now there is a Republican and a Democrat in our, state, in our congressional delegation teaming up to propose that more schools have access to Narcan. 
Today, Republican Congressman Doug Lamborn and Democrat Joe Neguse introduced a bill that would allow schools to use leftover COVID funding to buy Narcan, the drug that can reverse an overdose. Under the bill, the funds could also be spent on fentanyl awareness programs and training on that issue for school staff and students. The state education department says 29 students in Colorado died from taking fentanyl last school year. Statewide, there's a program that gives free access to Narcan to schools. You've got 26 districts at this point, including Denver, that are participating. We are getting some feedback tonight on a political ad that is actually not on our air. Next viewer named Bruce wrote in to ask why he's not seeing more of this ad, which mocks Governor Polis, sings a song about him. Bruce writes, why isn't that version played more often? Seems that Channel 9 is edited. Or did the governor object and ask for censorship? And Channel 9 caved into the pressure. Bruce, I love a, a conspiracy theory as much as the next guy, but this one's actually quite simple. Ads run on television when somebody purchases ad time from the sales department upstairs in this building. The group that created that particular ad, it's a group funded by a wealthy oil and gas executive, is not paying to air that commercial on the local stations in Denver. Now, they did it once during the Broncos season opener and in the process convinced a few reporters to write about it. That's actually a common tactic for political groups that want exposure for their ad message but don't have the money to buy the airtime. Should tell you, ad sales operate independently from our newsrooms, our journalists, but the political ad files for every station in town are public online. You can look just as I did today. And no local station in town is airing that particular anti-polis ad right now. Mutiny Information Cafe, counterculture icon in Denver, is making a wild comeback. So the city seized that bookstore coffee shop and took it for back taxes. Within 24 hours, people who love the place raised tens of thousands of dollars to pay off the tax lien and even more to keep mutiny going. Here's Katie Eastman. For the last 10 years, the Mutiny Information Cafe has stood out on South Broadway. It's a safe haven for people that don't fit the mold on the outside, a space for local artists, a spot to grab a coffee. Um, we really think about the people in our community and what we can offer them because they offer us a lot. Co-owner Matt Megacy watched as those artists, comic book writers, musicians, and pinball aficionados all donated to the place that gave them a space to be themselves. In three days, they raised more than $57,000 to help the cafe pay back the more than 30,000 in taxes they owed to the city of Denver. Well, we'd already been wary of the fact that, you know, we have lots of bills to pay. Matt has heard the naysayers who tell him and his business partner they made bad business decisions, but he says they just had one too many rainy days. There's always something around the corner that's going to spring out there and surprise you. First the pandemic, and then Matt had a series of strokes and a heart attack that put him in a coma. We had great plans for 2022, and then right at the beginning of the year, I ended up going to the hospital and uh, taking a nap for about three months. <laughs> they paid their employees and the rent, but taxes fell behind. With this money raised, they'll be able to pay off more than just their taxes and continue to survive on South Broadway. I can't imagine doing anything else, really. Matt says the next hurdle will be the minimum wage increase in the new year. Right now, he says they pay most of their employees a little more than the current minimum wage, but he says the jump to $17.29 will be a struggle they'll likely raise their coffee prices to make it work. Not the first time they've done one of these direct appeals. No, they raised about $17,000 earlier this year when Matt initially went through his health struggles. He told me he hopes this is the last time they need a GoFundMe. You know, I hope so too, but in, in one way, it's not any different than any other place. They stay in business because people like them, yes. care about them, and are willing to trade American dollars for them. All right, thank you, Katie. There are teachers across Colorado who have dreams of what they could do in their classrooms if they just had the funding. You're going to help several of those projects happen as you have now raised $30,000 in counting for the Nathan Yip Foundation. That nonprofit offers grants to rural teachers and rural school districts, like to build a playground on the Ute Mountain Ute Reservation, to put together an auto repair program in Peyton, drones for the science classes out in Eads. Through 120 of your weekly Word of Thanks microgiving campaigns, you've now raised $9.6 million for nonprofits across our state. Do you know of a great nonprofit that could use our help next? 
email me an idea. I read each and every email that comes to next at 9news.com. Of course, I'll be back on Wednesday with our newest microgiving idea. A couple of Colorado's highest peaks might get demoted. Scientists are recalculating elevations across the country. Colorado is such an easy place to talk about elevations. You're right, everybody cares about it. Yeah, that 14 year you climbed might not be able to count it anymore. We'll look at how Colorado's fire season and snow season are feeding into each other, not in a good way. And they are picking up trash and friends. That's next. Some of Colorado's highest points are likely to get a bit shorter. Next question tonight is about climate change and elevation in Colorado. Larry wanted to know, what could warmer temperatures, melting glaciers, and the rising sea levels mean for Colorado's elevations? Ah, Larry, I love that question. So as we redefine what qualifies as a 14er, they'd have to reprint everything from posters to T-shirts going to put a hole in some people's bucket list. I mean, think about that. Changing elevations wouldn't just potentially impact the state's 54 14ers, all those towns that list elevation on the sign instead of population. Denver would have to fake its whole mile high thing by measuring up a step or two on the state capitol. You know, that's how it's done, right? Mile high in Denver is actually the 15th step up on the west side of the capitol. Rise in sea levels could mean Colorado's losing 14ers like Huron or Sunshine. The, the lowest 14er is Mount Sunshine. You know, have you measured it? Will it still be a 14er? Um, and the short answer is no, we haven't measured it yet. But everything more or less across Colorado from southeast corner to the northwest corner, everywhere in between, um, is two feet too high right now. So all those signs probably are going to drop by a couple feet. Uh-oh. Derek Van Westrum works at an observatory in Boulder for the National Geodetic Survey, which I heard of for the first time today. You just heard him say that most of the elevation markers across the state are too high by a couple of feet because of the old way of measuring. His team's been working on how to modernize our sea level measurements. In the olden days, they'd go down to the ocean, they'd put a marker at the mean tide level and measure elevation using rulers and telescopes. Now they have a new height system that measures gravity to determine sea level. If sea level's gone up, maybe you know, a few millimeters for a centimeter, we're now wrong. So our plan is to keep track of that. If the water's coming up and the mountain doesn't change, the mountain is just getting lower and lower above sea level each year. So you've got old measurements plus cha climate change changing the sea level. So perhaps get ready to pick a new step at the state capitol. Might have to repaint that purple stripe on the seats at Coors Field. When will we know? The team planned to release their new elevation numbers this year. Then there was a government shutdown and a pandemic, so that pushed back their timeline a couple of years. They're hoping to finish their work by next year and have it ready to go out by 2025. And again, you're thinking, how much money are we spending to figure out just how high the mountain is? There are very practical reasons for this government project. Uh, a lot of your acronym agencies, USGS, FEMA, FAA, Army Corps of Engineers, they rely on that data when it comes to mapping floodplains and infrastructure plans, even flight maps. That was a good question, Larry. I love where that took us. If you have a question that can take us in a new direction, email next at 9news.com. So parts of our high country burned in 2020 like we've never seen. You had an area half the size of Rhode Island burned up in a matter of months in the fall, too. New research out of CSU found that those megafires may be impacting our water supply for years. Researchers found that snow melts sooner in places that have recent wildfires, two weeks earlier than normal at higher elevations, nearly a month earlier melting at lower elevations. They blame that on the loss of trees, less shade for the snow that falls, and ash blown onto the snowpack can change the color of the surface and take in more heat. That earlier snow melt poses a problem for our water supply. Water that we would have relied on later in the season is coming down the mountain sooner than we'd like. The impact from wildfires persists over many years to decades. Uh, forests don't recover instantaneously from these disturbances. And so it's a process that's accumulating through time. Each summer that we have more kind of more fires burning in these snowy regions means that a greater percentage of the West is experiencing the impacts of these wildfires. So researchers say it becomes a cycle. Shorter snow seasons can then in turn hurt long-term recovery from the wildfires because the sun has more time to dry out that exposed ground. 
No Monday blues around here. It was picture perfect out there. A gorgeous shot overlooking downtown Denver and beyond. Just a couple of clouds. Otherwise, the sunshine in 80s back in action across the Front Range, the Eastern Plains, some 60s and 70s up into the mountains. We still have a couple of isolated thunderstorms still firing up around parts of the San Juans near Telluride. Otherwise, by about 10, 11 o'clock, everything clears out. Tomorrow morning, we'll wake up to a few clouds out there. And then by the afternoon, I'd say between 4 to 5, we'll be tracking a few storms rolling off the foothills in Jefferson, Douglas counties, and then quickly moving off to the uh, Palmer Divide and then Eastern Plains. Here in Denver, a very, very small chance that we get some gusty winds, maybe a rumble of thunder, but that really is going to be about it. This ridge of high pressure is going to continue to shift off to the east. By about Thursday, it starts to break down, making way for that next storm system to roll in Friday and into Saturday. Temps tomorrow, pretty similar to what we saw today, back to the upper 70s, low 80s for many of us here in eastern Colorado with some 60s and 70s up in the mountains. We do get warmer with some isolated storms on Thursday and then low 70s on deck with a good chance of rain on Saturday, upper 60s to kick off next week. One man's trash is another kid's fascination. Oh, that's the garbage! That's the garbage! <laughs> Two kids who never get tired of trash day and the guys who go out of their way to make it special for them. Next. There are people many of us rarely think about who deserve enormous thanks. Take away trash collection and see just how quickly cities would fall apart. You know who doesn't take the garbage and recycling workers for granted? Kids. Our Mike Grady has a story of friendship. When you're a kid, the smallest things in life seem huge. Not mobile. Abel Papazoglu digs marbles. Chomp a chomp, chomp. Yum, 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 yum. Big brother Sam's dino rules. Chomp, chomp, chomp. But there's one toy they fight over. Excuse me. Oh, yeah, it's, it's got a full it's a recycling truck. I think they just love big trucks. Mom knows the only way to beat the little things in life is with the real it's thing. It's on. Every week we stand out there and wait for the garbage truck to come. It's, very, it's like the highlight of their week. Oh, that's the garbage! That's the garbage! <laughs> Since the pandemic, Sam and Abel have looked forward to weekly visits from two special people. Will and Molly, the government. And of course, yes. they're Rick. My best friends that help me throw the trash. Will Ordaz collects. Favorite part is when we get to these uh, little kids. Mario Flores drives. And the kids supervise. Oh yeah, they always help me out. Right, boys? Is it full? No, it's not. I just got to run it. It pretty much makes my day, you know what I mean? Oh, we have a lot of garbage. Now, one of those little moments in life has turned into the main event. Bye, Sam. Bye, Bye Abel. For next, I'm Mike Grady. Your, your feedback has a solution to shorter mountains. Next. Charles says instead of changing the elevation markers on mountains, why not hire climbers to build two-foot cairns at the top of each one? That's genius. Dolores says, isn't it interesting that women can walk topless in Fort Collins? Dolores, that ruling applies statewide, including wherever you are now. Do whatever you will with that.